Okay. Welcome everyone to Chris Cox's master's thesis defense. We worked with Chris for the last year on this stuff, and uh, he's been doing really good work. So it's nice for him to be able to finally share with everybody. So I hope you enjoy. Thanks, Derek. So um, this is my final defense. As Derek mentioned, May of 2014, two mathematicians disappeared in an office in Carver Hall while pursuing Ramsey numbers of hypergraphs. A year later, their theorems were found. But anyway, let's just recall that, um, that a k-uniform hypergraph, we're going to be doing graph theory. K-uniform hypergraph is, of course, just a pair of vertices and a set of edges, where the edges consist are uh, k-sets of vertices. So every edge has exactly k vertices in it. A two-uniform hypergraph is what we commonly call a graph, where every edge has exactly two vertices. Um, for a bit of notation that we're going to be using throughout uh, the presentation, we're going to use k sub n to the k to denote the complete k-uniform hypergraph on n vertices. So in other words, you have n vertices, and you're going to take every single k set as your edge set. As the two-uniform case is special, we'll oftentimes just kind of abbreviate k sub n squared as k sub n, the complete graph of order n. And as we're doing some Ramsey stuff, we need just formal definitions of coloring, but of course it's fairly obvious what's going on most of the time. A t coloring of the edge set of the complete graph is simply a mapping, we call it c, from the edge set into the integers 1 through t. So basically color 1, color 2, up to color t. And we say that c, this coloring, admits a copy of a certain graph in color i if there's a copy of this graph where every single edge receives color i. In other words, it's contained inside of the inverse image of this color i. And uh, given uh, t, k uniform hypergraphs, g1 through gt, the graph nut Ramsey number, called r of g1 through gt, is the least integer such that no matter how I color the complete graph, I'm always going to find a monochromatic copy of gi in color i for one of the i's. So I'm always going to find a graph in this right color that I'm looking for. And if Ramsey's theorem says that eventually this guy will be there. Equivalently, uh, something that we'll use quite often is that the Ramsey number is also the greatest integer such that I can color the complete graph of order one fewer and actually avoid monochromatic copies of each of my graphs. So for notational purposes, if all of the GIs happen to be the same graph, we're going to kind of do a little bit of uh, abbreviation here. R of G1 through GT, just R sub T of G. So we're looking for the exact same graph in each color. We refer to this as the diagonal case. If some of the GIs are different, called the off-diagonal case. So of course with graph Ramsey and everything, you have to talk about the two-colored Ramsey number of the triangle, which is six. All, pretty much anyone who's taken an undergraduate course in graph theory knows this. In order to show that it's bigger than or equal to six, we need to show a, a two-coloring of K5 that actually avoids monochromatic copies of a triangle. And there one is. In color five vertices have no triangles in either color. And the standard argument to show that it equals six, we have to show no matter how you color the edges of K6, you always end up with a monochromatic triangle. So we start out with our six vertices here. By the pigeonhole principle, three of the edges have to be the same color, so let's say red. Now if we look at these edges, vertices down here, either any one of the edges between them are red, in which case we get a red triangle. Otherwise, all three are blue, but there's our blue triangle. So there we go. We need their proof in here. So R of three, three, R2 of K3 is six. And this is basically what we're going to be repeating over and over again, these types of arguments to show the lower and upper bounds on Ramsey number. So if we consider, say, the Ramsey number, the t-colored Ramsey number of the path on three vertices, it's pretty easy by pigeonhole principle to see that, in fact, the t-colored Ramsey number is less than or equal to t plus 2. And this is simply, if I look at any vertex, I can have at most one edge of each color coming off of it. And therefore, I have at most t plus 2 vertices to begin with. But let's look about at ordering this graph in different ways, placing a total ordering on the vertices. With P3 here, the path on three vertices, I can order it in three non-isomorphic ways, where the center vertex is either in the center, at the beginning, or at the end. So it, from these two orderings right here, it's pretty easy to see that the Ramsey number is less than or equal to T plus 2, because I simply look at the first vertex, or I look at the last vertex. But consider this coloring of the complete graph of order 8, where I've actually labeled all of the vertices 1 through 8. As we notice, there are certainly lots of monochromatic copies of both of these, just as we look at the first vertex or the last vertex. And in fact, there is a monochromatic copy of, say, a P8, simply going back and forth inside of the red. However, I never actually see a copy of this first one, this monotonically ordered copy of P3. If I look at any vertex here, its neighbors to the left are always going to be a different color than its neighbors to the right. 
And therefore, I never actually see copies of this single monotonically ordered graph. So we can kind of do this and say, well, if I only care about finding this ordered copy, I can actually color two to the t vertices and avoid it to see that two to the t can take two copies of this guy, set them next to each other, and introduce the new color between them. And this, again, will avoid all of these monotonically ordered copies. And this is really the crux of ordered Ramsey number. We want to only find a particular order. So formally, an ordered graph is simply a hypergraph where the vertex set has a total ordering on it. And we'll mainly say ordered with the integers 1 through n. And we say that, a that an ordered graph is a subgraph of another ordered graph if, well, it is a subgraph. And secondly, if there is, in fact, uh, if the order is preserved. So as I mentioned there, we found a couple of the other copies, but the monotonic copy we didn't actually find there. And from this, very simple to define, the ordered Ramsey number is basically the exact same notion as the graph Ramsey number, except now we start out with ordered graphs. We color the complete graph that, of the, the ordered complete graph, and we again look for monochromatic copies of each of our GIs. We'll note the ordered Ramsey number by OR of G1 through GT. And again, in the diagonal case, we're going to use this shorthand to make things easier on ourselves. So, of course, the first question is, does it exist? Well, yes. If any ordering of the complete graph is isomorphic to any other ordering of the complete graph, because we have every single edge. So, in fact, the ordered Ramsey number of the complete graph is the same as the graph Ramsey number of the complete graph. So, we always have that the ordered Ramsey number exists. But, in general, the ordered Ramsey number can be much, much larger than the graph Ramsey number as we showed looking at the path on three vertices. Certain orderings give us a linear bound, and other orderings give us actually an exponential bound in terms of the number of colors, so a very large difference. So what we're going to be doing is looking more at this kind of P3, except generalizing it. We're interested in what the ordered Ramsey number of what are called KL paths. So the naturally ordered KL paths, which will denote P to the KL sub E, is a K-uniform hyperpath, where every edge, where it's K-uniform, of course, and if I look at any two consecutive edges, they intersect in L vertices. So a couple examples here. If I look at the 2, 1 path, well, every edge consists of two vertices. And if I look at two consecutive edges, they intersect in a single vertex, hence the 2, 1. And the 5 is because I'm on five edges here. Here's the 5, 3 path. Every edge consists of five vertices. And if I look at any two consecutive edges, they intersect in three. Pretty simple. Another example, the 3, 2 path here, every edge has three vertices, and if I look at two consecutive edges, they intersect in exactly two vertices. And again, five edges for all of these guys. So uh, if L is equal to K minus 1, we refer to this as a tight path, simply because there's no room between the consecutive edges. And in the case of, say, this 5, 3 path, we call it a loose path because there's kind of room between where these consecutive edges be start and end. So the first question is, well, what is the ordered Ramsey number of these KL paths? Well, in this direction, Chodam and Punusami actually found exactly the ordered Ramsey number of two one paths to be this product right here. And this is a very natural extension of the erdos zekeresh theorem on increasing and decreasing subsequences, except applied to kind of multiple colors. Uh, looking at three two paths, uh, Fox, Patch, Sudikov, and Sook actually showed that it's exponential in terms of the number of edges and doubly exponential in the terms of number of colors. And this was studied in, uh, in relation to what's called the happy ending theorem, trying to find convex bodies inside of general uh, positions of vertices. And to improve upon this, Moshkovich and Shapiro actually very recently showed that in fact the upper bound is a bit closer to being tight, and in fact it's 2 to the theta of e to the t minus 1, where the theta is actually pretty reasonable. I think the upper bound is 2 and the lower bound is either 2 thirds or 3 halves. Well, what about general k, if we want to look at bigger k? Well, if we look at these tower functions that we'll be using a lot, we'll refer to these guys. The tower function of height 0 of x is just going to give us that x. And if I want to care about the tower function of height h of x, it's simply going to be h2 stacked on top of each other, and then a little lonely x sitting at the top. And Moshkovich and Shapira also showed that if I care about these tight paths, k with k minus 1, that in fact it grows as a tower of height k minus 2 in terms of the number of edges, and grows as a tower of height k minus 1 in terms of the number of colors. And in fact, even though these uh, things at the very top of the tower seem to be kind of far off in terms of the number of colors, it's really not because when it gets to these hypergraph Ramsey numbers, we're very happy just have, having that tower height be the same on both the upper and lower. 
So again, all of these results have been for the tight hyperpath when we have k, k minus 1. What about the loose hyperpath? Well, in order to do this, we'll need this definition, the simultaneous intersection number, which is going to be denoted I of KL, which is very simply just a fancy word for the maximum degree of the KL path once I get enough edges. So if I look here at the 5, 3 path, I can notice that I of 5, 3 equals 3 because I have here a vertex of degree 3. So basically, it's just the maximum degree once I get enough edges that it really embodies what's going on. So once I have at least k edges, simply the maximum degree. And it's a fairly simple observation to actually pin down the intersection number just by looking at the ratio of L to k. But this isn't more about calculating it, it's more about what we can do with this intersection number. So the first thing Derek and I were able to show was actually a very close relationship between the loose paths and the tight paths. In fact, we showed that there's really no difference between calculating the ordered Ramsey number of the loose path and the tight path. Simply k minus l times the tight path, where we look at that intersection number, the max degree, plus l prime. So what's really interesting about this is that really the values of k and l don't matter too much. All that really matters is the maximum degree. All of the uh, growth rates will be very similar. The simple corollary of this, uh, using the bound by Chodam and Kunusami for the 2-1 uh, two, two, uh, two path, we're able to get an exact formula if the max degree equals 2. Unfortunately, for the rest of them, we're not able to get an exact formula, but we can apply the bounds of Moshkovich and Shapira in order to get basically that uh, the ordered Ramsey number of the type of the loose path grows at a tower of height the max degree minus 2 in terms of the number of edges, and max degree minus 1 in terms of the number of color. A little bit of mention on this proof right here. We do actually have a direct proof. But in fact, we're able to reprove all of the results by Moshkovich and Shapira by actually going into a post-set theoretic type construction and locating, in essence, exactly what the number is. The problem is actually pinning down the number the size of this post-set is very difficult, and it's very closely related to a difficult problem called uh, Dedekind's problem. So something that we can notice is that if I look at this KL path and let L equal 0, what we're really looking at is a matching, where all of the edges are found consecutively. In fact, although um, looking at the relationship between the type path doesn't give us this theorem, our proof using POSETS actually lets us pin down this ordered Ramsey number as well. However, we're able to do slightly better, so I'd like to transition a bit into talking about hypermatchings. So first of all, we'll do this thing called a KR nested matching. So we're going to build these iteratively on the number of edges, where we say that for integers k and r, uh, the edge set, so basically M1 KR is just a single K uniform edge, so if I'm looking at K equals 5, there's M1 of 5, whatever. And if I want to build the next guy up, add more edges, I'm going to take, based on my value of R, R vertices, lay them to the right of this guy, the rest of the vertices, lay them to the left, and add in that extra edge. So if, say, I'm interested in 5, 3, here's 5, 3, 1. Here's 5, 3, 2. I take a 5 uniform edge, lay 3 vertices to the right, 2 vertices to the left, and I can build M5, 3, 3, 3 edges, and I can keep doing this as much as I want. So notice that, in fact, if R is either 0 or K, I actually get back to the K0 path, because I'm going to either lay all of them at the beginning or all of them at the end. I guess this is the beginning of them. So we were actually able to show that the ordered Ramsey number of these nested matchings pretty much is exactly the same as the uh, K0 path. Even though we have a more complicated structure going on, we still arrive at the exact same bound. And this should actually be seen as the true way to show that the K0 path has the right Ramsey number, simply because, well, for two reasons. One, this proof is more general. And two, the proof is actually easier, because we're only looking at a specific case of these matching. So is this from uh, construction or actual summary? Uh, so for the lower bound, we have a coloring that works even if the nested, even the, the nesting patterns are different, uh -huh. and then if the nesting patterns are all the same, there's just a really kind of stupid induction you can do. You just kind of peel off the largest edge, and then you can find whatever you're looking so, for. Maybe you'll get to this, but do you think this is always the answer for matchings? Yes. Well, for, for these this. particular matchings, yeah. Yeah. when you have when you have oh, you mean if the nesting patterns are different? Uh, do you think this should be an equality? Well, so if, if the R's are all equal, then it is equality. Yeah. If it's not, uh, my guess is... I actually don't have a guess. Derek, do you have an idea? I have a feeling that you can be off by a small factor. Yeah, probably. it's... I, I bet it's still linear. Like a constant factor or... Probably. 
my guess is that there may be an additive factor. Okay. My guess is that it still was with here. You can't, uh, you, in my mind, it doesn't seem reasonable that you could make it more than linear by just changing the nesting pattern. I mean, it, it might be something like add log k or something. Maybe, maybe something, something like that. But I'm not sure. Yeah. The the proof that we have, I I did try to modify it to see if we can deal with the more off diagonal, and it just wasn't working. I'm sure you could. I'm not exactly sure. We didn't look at it too much with the off diagonal. We were just happy with oh, if all the nesting patterns are the same. We're good. Happy. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so something that. Uh, in comparison, I just wanted to give this result by Alon, Frankel, and Labosch that actually pins down the Ramsey number of k-uniform matchings exactly. Um, and in fact, I want you to notice that they're really not very far off. The ordered matching, the ordered Ramsey number of these very specific matchings, is within a constant factor of the graph Ramsey number, which is interesting given that the ordered Ramsey number is in general much, much larger especially what we saw with paths, where we get tower functions in terms of the ordered paths, but the graph Ramsey is actually conjectured to be linear. So going into arbitrary orderings of k-uniform paths, we've really been uh, looking at what happens if we have a very particular ordering. What can we say about the Ramsey number? Well, what if I know what type of graph I'm starting with, and I want to say for any ordering, I can never be larger than something? Well, in this direction, Conlon, Foxley, and Tudikov actually explored uh, for matching. And they said that no matter what ordering you give to a two-uniform matching on E edges, the ordered Ramsey number can be no larger than 2 to the ceiling log 2e to the t. So in other words, it will grow quasi-polynomially in terms of the number of edges, and it can never grow more than doubly exponentially in terms of the number of colors. And they also showed that this is fairly tight in the two-color sense. When you have two colors, it's actually fairly tight. Most, uh, asymptotically, almost every two-uniform ordered matching comes close to achieving this bound. So what we'd like to do is see how far we can push this into k-uniform land before it breaks. So the first thing we'd want to try to do is try to repeat this guy right here, comparing a complete graph against a bunch of ordered matching. Unfortunately, this isn't going to work out too well if we just take the complete k-uniform graph, because the Ramsey number of the k-uniform graph is absolutely enormous, and we want a reasonable bound. So what we're going to do is come up with a different analog of kn. So we're going to call it gs to the k. We're going to again build it iteratively. g0 to the k is going to consist of a single vertex. And if I want to build gs to the k, I'm going to take k copies of gs minus 1 to the k, lay them next to each other, and take every single k-uniform edge that intersects every single one of the copies. So if I say k equals 3, g0, 3, simply an isolated vertex here. And if I want to build g1, I'm going to take three copies, and introduce every single three uniform edge that intersects all of these copies. If I now want to build G2, I can take three copies of G1 and, and take every single K uniform, three uniform edge in this case that intersects all of our copies. And we can keep doing this as, as many times as we want, and you can see how this generalizes to an arbitrary K. So using this construction, we're actually able to reconstruct their lemma here which says that the ordered Ramsey number, if I look at this gs to the k and compare it to a bunch of k-uniform ordered matchings, I can iteratively bound it above by just the ordered Ramsey number of these matchings. And it is very important that we have this graph because we break up our, we break up this number into a bunch of pieces and say, oh, well, suppose I don't have this gs, then I have to have different colors and I can kind of induce an auxiliary coloring that forces me to find my match. Vague and poorly spoken, but all right. So there's a simple observation from this guy: is that if I have an ordered matching that is contained in G S to the K and E edges, then I have a very simple upper bound on the ordered Ramsey number. Note that this actually uh, repeats the common box Lee Sudikov bound because G uh, G S to the two happens to be this, the complete graph on two to the S vertices. But of course this. Uh, subgraph property is not always easy to check. I don't want to just say, oh, I have a matching, check and see if it can be embedded into this GS to the K. That's not nice, especially because we have hypergraphs. So we come up with a simple definition that really embodies the property. So we call these K-nestable matchings. So K-nestable matching on E edges is going to be an ordered matching where I can find K intervals satisfying a few properties. One, they partition the vertex set. 
such that the first vertex lies in the first interval and the last vertex lies in the last interval. A few properties, if I look at any edge inside of my matching, either it is completely contained inside of one of these intervals, or it intersects every single interval non-trivially. And lastly, the matching, if I look at only the edges inside of an interval, it is recursively k-nestable as well. I can do the same exact thing. So a couple examples. If I look at this 5-3 uh, nested matching that I mentioned earlier, right here is a 5 nesting of it. If you notice, every edge, so I have five intervals. They span the entire thing. If I look at any edge, it is either completely contained within an interval or it intersects every interval non-trivially. And if I look at the matching induced by each interval, either it's empty with these singletons or it consists of another k-nestable matching, so five nestable in this case. Another example here, uh, four uniform ordered graph, and I can find a four nesting right here. And if I look inside of each interval, in this case these all have empty matchings inside of them, and this one only has a single edge, so it's again four nestable. And in fact, this is exactly the property that it requires to be embedded inside of this GS to the K. In fact, if you have a K nestable matching with E edges, it can be embedded to G E plus log E, basically. Uh, the reason we have the V vertices there is to make our induction step easy, where we kind of peel off vertices, edges, and then we can embed in a nice way. So putting everything together, we're in fact able to show that the ordered Ramsey number of uh, any K nestable ordered matching can be at most this bound. I want to quickly compare this to the kahneman fox lee Zudikov bound, and notice that this actually is much larger in terms of the number of edges. It becomes exponential in terms of the number of edges, whereas there it's quasi-polynomial in terms of the number of edges. Unfortunately, there's no way to get around this, because even those simple k, uh, k nestable, uh, sorry, kr nested, nested matchings, we can't embed them into smaller copies of this GS graph. You actually need at least a so a couple comments. In fact, most graph, most ordered matchings are not going to turn out to be k-nestable once k is at least 4. In fact, even when k is 3. If you just have edges that look somewhat like this, it's impossible to k-nest it. And probably with high probability, if you, I randomly throw down a few edges, I'm going to get stuff that looks somewhat like this. So going on a little bit, we've been talking a lot about these ordered matching, these uh, ordered graphs and looking at the Ramsey number there. But what if I only, say, have a partial ordering on my, on my vertex set? What I mean by that is if I look at these three graphs and look at kind of the arrows, what if I only care about finding a copy where if the arrow points from vertex B to vertex U, then B is less than or equal to U? In that case, trying to find a copy of this graph, I'd be very happy with either three of these here. They're really describing the same partial ordering. Well, I could just say look for families inside of each uh, color, but we're actually going to get a bit further and define a new notion of partially ordered Ramsey numbers, kind of as a direct extension of the ordered <coughs> Ramsey number, and in fact we can do some really interesting things with it. So a couple preliminaries, kind of stepping back for a moment. So remember, a post set is of course a set with a binary relation that is reflexive, anti-symmetric, and transitive. And a bit of notation, we're going to use a chain to be a post set where every pair of elements are comparable. An anti-chain denotes a post set where every pair of elements are incomparable, so the complement to the chain. And we're going to use bracket n to denote the chain on n elements, so really think about it as the, as the numbers 1 through n, just totally ordered. And we're going to use 2 to the n to denote the Boolean lattice of order n. So we'll be referring to these, so the Boolean lattice being all the subsets ordered. Secondly, uh, post-set homomorphism is simply a map that preserves the partial ordering. So I can take a map from one post-set to another, where if two elements are related in the first post-set, they become related in the second post-set. And we say that Q contains a copy of P if, in fact, I can find an injective post-set homomorphism from P to Q. And I think last definition, really, is a linear extension of a post-set is simply a new partial ordering that's put onto our post-set where it forms a chain and uh, basically preserves the original ordering there. So I can extend my partial ordering to a total ordering. And it's always possible to do this. So, post-set graphs here. Kind of starting with the order graphs, we want to make this a lot more general. So a post-set graph G is a triple, V of G, E of G, and some relation, where if I only look at the vertex set in the relation, I get a post-set. 
So basically, there's a partial ordering on my vertex set. And my edges are allowed to be any subset of the comparable pairs. So if I have an edge, I had to have had a relation with there as well. If uh, the edge set consists of all comparable pairs, we're going to call it the comparability graph of the post set. So for any post set, I can form the comparability graph by taking the vertex set and taking the edge set to be any comparable related elements. So in this definition, an ordered graph is simply a post set graph where the vertex set is totally ordered, where the vertex set happens to be a chain. So already we have a generalized a bit. And we can likewise define k-uniform post-set graphs by letting uh, the edges be any subset of the k-chain. But we're mainly going to focus on two-uniform for the sake of brevity in this talk. So for example, and end up with a post-set graph. So there's a post-set graph, people. Yay! So we again have the notion of containment, which we need for Ramsey, which is simply, it's going to be contained as a subgraph and also this mapping has to be a post-set homomorphism as well. So I can find an embedding where all of the edges are preserved and the relation is preserved as well. So if I consider these two post-set graphs right here, one on the left and the one on the right, the one on the left is actually a sub-post-set graph of the one on the right, simply carried out by this mapping. Every edge here maps to an edge there, and every relation is preserved. However, notice that the edges are actually mapped bijectively, so I'd want to be able to flip it around and say that the right is contained in the left. But I can't do that simply because these two elements are related, whereas these two are not. So even if I ignore the actual partial ordering here, they are certainly subgraphs. They're actually the same graph if I ignore the partial ordering. But with this, these different partial orderings, I have different post-set graphs. So with this, we can kind of define the very natural extension of the ordered Ramsey number, which we'll call the chain Ramsey number which given post-set graphs G1 through GT, it's the least integer such that I can color the complete graph and find these partially ordered graphs in it. So if G1 through GT are, happen to actually be ordered graphs to begin with, this is exactly the ordered Ramsey number. The thing is that by, require, by not requiring that certain elements are related inside of my post-set graphs, it gives me a bit more freedom. And if GI prime is a linear extension of this graph, so I linearly extend the underlying post set and keep all of the edges, I can always bound above the chain Ramsey number by the ordered Ramsey number. And in fact, equality holds whenever GI has a unique linear extension. So I take any linear extension, and it turns out to be isomorphic to any other linear extension in terms of the number of edges. Then we also have equality between the chain Ramsey and the ordered Ramsey. That's a fairly simple fact. So, Derek and I do prove a few things about the chain Ramsey number, but they're not overly interesting because most of it can be phrased in terms of the ordered Ramsey number. But the real benefit is into defining this host set Ramsey number for other host graphs. So we can do this in general, but I want to just talk about kind of a very interesting extension into the Boolean lattice. So we're going to use notationally this kind of script BN, which I'll call the Boolean graph of order N. It's going to denote the comparability graph of the Boolean lattice of order. And for post-set graphs G1 through GT, we can define the Boolean Ramsey number to be the least integer n such that any t-coloring of the edge set of this Boolean graph contains a monochromatic copy of GI in color I for some i. It's a very natural thing. So an observation here using the chain Ramsey number is that we can get a bound on the Boolean Ramsey number very nicely. The upper bound, of course, telling us that it exists. And the upper bound follows from the fact that the Boolean graph contains a copy of the complete graph of order n plus 1. And the lower bound follows from the fact that the Boolean, that I can try to color, say, 2 to the n vertices, the edge set of uh, the complete graph of order 2 to the n. This induces a coloring of the Boolean graph. And therefore, if I always find a copy in terms of this Boolean graph, I must always find a copy in terms of this 2 to the n complete graph. So we can always bound it below by the log of the chain Ramsey number. And we will use, actually, this bound quite a bit, because a lot more is known about the chain Ramsey number, although not explicitly. So first of all, if we look at, say, matchings, so we're going to take the comparability graph of a bunch of disjoint chains of length 2. This, of course, is a matching where I don't really care about the relationships between different edges, but I only care about you know, that they are edges there we're actually able to show that the Boolean Ramsey number is basically theta of the log of adding up all of the sizes of these matchings. The lower bound follows from the fact that the chain Ramsey number of these matchings is going to be the same as the graph Ramsey number, 
because I don't care about the relations between edges. And therefore, I can bound it below by the log of the chain Ramsey number. And the upper bound is a very simple, uh, just pigeonhole argument, where I kind of do a reduction. Notice that actually the upper and lower bounds are off by at most one in the worst case scenario. I do believe that the upper bound is always true, but trying to actually find a coloring is really difficult, so I gave up. Yay for not sticking with it. So looking at some other things, a few other graphs that we looked at in terms of this Boolean Ramsey number are the R cup and R cap. So the R cup, which we'll denote, I'll call it cup R, simply is, well, we have a cup with R prongs on it. I think this is sometimes also called the R fork for people who do posets. I think that's the actual underlying poset, and then we put the graph structure on it as well. And the R cap, R prongs going down. And we looked at the Boolean Ramsey number if I look at cup versus cap. If I look at cup versus cup, well, that's just a very simple poset, uh, pigeonhole argument where I look at the guy who has the largest downset. If I look at cup versus cup, I look at the guy who has the largest upset and can get basically log of R. But if I look at cup versus cap, one, the chain Ramsey number is really described in terms of ordered Ramsey numbers because any linear extension is the same. So I can bound it below by the log of the chain Ramsey number. And then the upper bound is found by a counting argument where I ignore the maximal element and try to count all of the, say, red edges that are left over. Count that in two different ways and we come up with this upper bound. So I do again want to mention that this is basically theta of log r plus s. We can print it down pretty closely. We're happy with theta in Ramsey land. So it does lead to a question. For what classes of poset graphs is the Boolean Ramsey number theta of the log of the chain Ramsey number? Our guess is, of course, the, most, the more anti-chains you have, the lower your Boolean Ramsey number will be because we can kind of spread our graph out among levels without requiring a bunch of relations. Um, the real question is, what does the ratio between, say, the height of the POSET graph and the width of the POSET graph have to be to guarantee this bound? And I don't know how to approach that question, but if any of you do, great. We can write a paper. So for the rest of the talk, uh, a few more minutes, maybe 10 minutes or so, I want to talk about just a small Ramsey number, say this diamond here. I want to locate the two-color Boolean Ramsey of this POSET graph right here, the diamond. Well, the chain Ramsey number is 11, because it's the same as the ordered Ramsey number, which has been determined. So that automatically, by the log lower bound and the upper bound, we're able to get that the Boolean Ramsey number, the two-color Boolean Ramsey number of the diamond is between 4 and 10. The claim that I have for you guys is that it's between 5 and 6, either 5 or 6. My guess is that it's 5. I don't know if Derek's made up his mind. I'm pretty sure it's 5. His computer has been running it for a long time and has not finished it. So that's why I'm guessing five is the right answer, because it should have found a coloring that didn't do it. But, so let's just walk through here a bit. Well, first of all, we have to show it's bigger than four, at least five. And to do that, we have a pretty coloring. So yay, no diamonds. Or maybe there are diamonds, and I'm just lying to you. I don't know. You want to go through and check every four? No? OK. We'll believe it. Doesn't have any diamonds. If I copied it from the computer correctly, no diamonds. So the Boolean Ramsey number is at least five. To show that it's less than or equal to seven, first of all, uh, we can do that by hand. We use this little lemma here that if we look at the diamond versus the two cap, I can argue that this number is four. Arguing that's bigger than three, we simply present a coloring. But showing it's bigger than four, what we'll do is we'll look at the Boolean graph of order four. And look at the maximal element. Because we avoid uh, these two caps in color blue, I can have at most one blue neighbor going down. Let's say that's over here. Could have been the minimal element. If it is the minimal element, actually our proof is easier, so I'm only going to talk about when it's not the minimal element. What I can, instead, what I can do is by kind of a projection thing here, because really we're looking at the four-dimensional cube, I can find a copy of B3 that avoids this element right here. It doesn't have the maximal element, and it doesn't have this element right here. If that element happens to be the minimal element, I again just take a B3, and as you'll see in a moment, it doesn't matter, that minimal element. But because it's a B3, actually that proof of cup versus cap shows that the Boolean Ramsey number of cup versus cap is 3. So I end up with a red 2 cup, 2 cup, which of course, because these are all red neighbors, gives me a diamond in the rough. 
If this does in fact happen to be the minimal element, it doesn't matter because these two guys will never be the minimal element and will still be connected to the maximal element of the diagram. So using this lemma, we can show that in fact the Boolean Ramsey number of the diamonds is less than or equal to seven. And the argument goes as follows. Look at the minimal element and look at the atoms, the singletons that lie directly above it. There are seven of these guys, so at least three of them have to be the same color. Let's say red. I can then look at their common upset, so the set of all guys that lie directly above these, and that forms a copy of B4. As we stated, the Boolean Ramsey number of the diamond versus the two wedge, two cut, sorry, two cap is four. So because I don't have diamonds in our theoretical coloring, I have to have a blue copy of the two cap. So I'm left with this structure right here, where I have a blue cap related downward to this kind of uh, three cup. So let's try coloring all of the relations between it in order to try to avoid diamonds. So if I look here, at least both of these edges cannot be blue, so let's just say that one's red. There's a lot of symmetry, so without lots of generality, I can do that. Given that this guy's red, forces both of these ones to be blue, or else I would end up with a blue diamond. Then forces this guy to be red, otherwise I'd have a blue diamond. Now look at this edge. If it's red, I have a red diamond. And if it's blue, I have a blue diamond. Uh-oh. Therefore, it's impossible. I've, I've forced this structure to happen, and I can't complete the coloring without creating a diamond in one color or the other. So the Boolean Ramsey number of the diamond is less than or equal to 7. We can actually show it's less than or equal to 6, as claimed, but this requires actually a very simple computer thing. What, it took like a second to find it, probably even less. But we do a very similar argument. We start out with six elements, and this time we're just going to go from the top, might as well. If I look at the elements lying directly below the top, at least two of them have to have the same color by a pigeonhole principle, so let's call it blue. And if I look at the common downset, I again get a copy of B4, because I'm in the lattice of order six. Well, by the computer, we can actually show that the diamond versus the three cup is also four. So I now have to have a three cup down here, but this is exactly the same structure that I had on the previous page that we showed we cannot complete the coloring without creating so we have, in fact, that the Boolean Ramsey number of the diamond is less than or equal to 6. Again, I believe it's 5. We've been running it through Derek's program, which can calculate these for uh, kind of small numbers. And it can't find a coloring of 5 so far that actually avoids diamonds, so that's why it's been running for a long time. But of course, the runtime is on the order of, what, 2 to the 3 to the 5. So it has to run for a long time to try to actually locate this number. As for a theoretical construction to show that it's five, I feel like I can almost get there, but not quite. We're not able to guarantee the nice structure that we are. Because it feels like we're giving away so much when looking at lattices of order six or seven. That five should be just perfect. Not. Makes me really sad. But anyway, a couple of remarks to finish us off here. Uh, going back to ordered Ramsey number in future work, we'd like to find a general upper bound for these pale paths if we don't have a monotonic. As I mentioned, we know pretty, for the most part, exactly what the ordered Ramsey number is if they're monotonically ordered. But what if we just do a random ordering? What happens to the ordered Ramsey number? Well, in this regard, it was shown that the two one paths, no matter how I order it, the ordered Ramsey number can never be larger than two to the O of log T, basically. Actually, Derek and I approved this, and then we found out someone else had proved it in a weird paper that was not about ordered Ramsey numbers. So. But basically, our proof is the same. So that's known. But unfortunately, the techniques that we used and they used do not extend to higher uniformities. We tried, we tried, we tried, could not do it. So in order to really approach this question, we need new techniques. But as most of us know, hypergraph Ramsey land is sad face land. So it's going to be difficult to come up with these techniques. Also, we'd like to explore upper bounds on the ordered Ramsey number of matchings again when it's not k-nestable. We have a nice theorem that shows what happens if they turn out to be k-nestable ordered matchings, but what if it's just an arbitrary ordered uh, Ramsey number? Again, we need new ideas in order to approach this. Uh, the Coleman fox lee Sudikoff paper, we push these theorems as far as they would go into k-uniform Ramsey land. Lastly, on partial ordered Ramsey number, there's a lot of questions that we can do also uh, based on what I didn't show you about all we can do with partially ordered Ramsey numbers. But some of the things that we did here, 
for what class of the post-set graph is the Boolean Ramsey number theta of the log of the chain Ramsey number? Again, what I'd really like to know here is what should the ratio between the width and the height be to guarantee this? Also, is the Boolean Ramsey number, the two color of the diamond, equal to five or six? My guess is five. Hopefully the computer will be able to finish up before we actually submit the paper. And also, what about T color diamond? A lot of our things really focus on what if we have two colors. I want to be able to force this structure inside of this downset or upset. But what about the asymptotic growth in terms of T colors? I can, um, we, we also have a definition of what happens with Boolean and Ramsey in terms of one uniform, which is kind of an extension of the pigeonhole principle to the Boolean lattice. And I can give you an upper bound on it using this one uniform, but of course the number we have to use there is going to be difficult to pin down in and of itself. It's of independent interest. But that's about it, so thanks. You're a pretty picture. You can check for that. We have a few minutes for the public to ask questions. Huh? All right. Then we thank you very much for coming. Thank you again.